oh man, I might get in trouble for saying this, but it's not the carbohydrates that are the problem. It's the high blood glucose for a longer period of time that becomes the problem. There's been way too much focus on demonizing the carbohydrates themselves and less focus on how our bodies actually utilize the carbohydrates. If our bodies use them, not really a problem. That's like functional metabolism. That's how things are supposed to be working. But when they're not working and our blood glucose stays elevated, that's when we run into a problem. So let's break down some of the risks that are associated with high levels of circulating glucose. One of the first things I want to focus on that isn't addressed a whole lot is vascular damage. And it's one of these things, like you hear vascular damage, you think, oh, that's not going to be a problem for me until I'm in my 60s, 70s. It could be a big problem. Okay, vascular damage is where your cells in your vascular system, okay, in your arteries, in your veins, in that whole system, they become affected. There are these things called endothelial cells. And what happens is when you consume carbohydrates, that's no big deal. Body uses it. But if you develop insulin resistance and your glucose is just running high, hyperglycemia, for extended periods of time, well, what happens is those glucose molecules go into the endothelial cells. And when they go into the endothelial cells, they convert into these metabolites. Okay. Now, there's a number of different metabolites that they convert into, and it's pretty, pretty complicated. We don't have to go down that rabbit hole with those specific metabolites. But the long and the short of it is these metabolites activate two very specific things. They activate the hexosamines pathway, and they activate the advanced glycation end product pathway. Now, what advanced glycation end products are, they sound like something that's only talked about in like the fringe, weird, woo-woo, witch doctor crowd. But advanced glycation end products, that's a very real thing. Like when you have high levels of glucose and you have these advanced glycation end products, what happens is they glycate. Okay, so it's like caramelizing an onion, right? You, you caramelize an onion and it goes from being an onion into being this like hardened, crystallized, glycated thing, right? Well, essentially that's what's happening with high levels of glucose and it's the metabolites that activate those pathways. So once you have chronically high levels of glucose because you're not dealing with carbs and you've been overeating carbs for so long that your high glucose is affecting things, that's where you start to run into actual vascular damage that can occur. So this ends up affecting you later on. You may not notice it immediately. It may take time, but that's gonna affect circulation. That can affect how your body metabolizes other things. Anyway, let's move on to the next one. People forget that there's inflammation associated with hyperglycemia. It is literally called hyperglycemia-induced nuclear factor kappa B activation. To paint a picture for you, nuclear factor kappa B is like the big master switch that is pulled from inflammation or for inflammation. If nuclear factor kappa B is activated, which rightfully so it should be activated at specific points in time, you're going to have a lot more pro-inflammatory genes that are turned on, okay? So nuclear factor kappa B is like the big genetic switch that kind of commands its troops to turn on. We have lots of different systems involved in inflammation, way too much for one video, way too much for a section of this video. But when we have high levels of circulating glucose, that can induce a higher degree of activation of nuclear factor kappa B. In fact, it's been demonstrated that diabetic people can have up to three times the activation of nuclear factor kappa B. So it's not uncommon in people with high circulating glucose to see higher levels of inflammation. Now, again, it would take me a hundred videos to explain all the potential negative attributes of chronically high inflammation, ranging from you know, poor communication at the cellular level, you know, potential fat accumulation, uh, potential brain fog. There's a lot of things that go along with it, but it's just one piece of this whole hyperglycemic issue. Now, before I get into the next ones, I want to make sure I sandwich this video, no pun intended, maybe a low carb sandwich, with some solutions for kind of controlling these kinds of things, okay? How your body deals with glucose is very important. And glucose disposal is one of the most important things that you can manage. Glucose disposal is, instead of it circulating through the bloodstream, you use that glucose, okay? It can be literally as simple as after you have carbohydrates, do some exercise, do some squats. Even, it sounds crazy, flexing muscles can actually suck up that glucose and make it so that it has a place to go, okay? I would rather, 
Sounds bad to say, but I would rather that that extra glucose go through de novo lipogenesis and turn into fat than sit in your bloodstream glycating and causing all these issues there. Okay, at least the fat I know you could burn, right? Some of the vascular damage and the inflammatory damage that occurs, I don't know if there's reversal for that. There probably, maybe there is, I don't know. I'm not qualified to say. Okay, so some exercise. Okay, also strategic timing between meals that you maintain insulin sensitivity. Okay, that's very important. Also, when you're having snacks, have snacks that are lower carbohydrate snacks. That way you're not constantly keeping your blood sugar elevated. Maybe more protein focused snacks so that you can kind of control that. If you want some ideas, I did put a link down below for Thrive Market. And don't worry, I'm gonna get back to the other stuff because there's a few more things I definitely need to talk about as far as risks with high glucose. But today's sponsor is Thrive Market. They have done a tremendous job of allocating what's called better for you foods, like the better for you category into a great spot. So it's where I do my grocery shopping. So I go there and I stock up my pantry. I've been doing so for four years now. Okay, I can stock up parts of my fridge. I can get sustainable meat and seafood options that I stock in my freezer. It's got everything you can think of all sorted by category, which is amazing for people that want to take the, like the guesswork out. They just want to trust, okay, this is what is better for me. I want to use this, you know, yada, yada. For me, it's that plus the convenience factor. Okay, I don't want to go to the grocery store. I want to be able to just get what, I, it's so, it has made my life with my family so much better because it's convenient, the guesswork is taken out of it, it's just easy and it has my stamp of approval on it. So that link down below gets you 25% off your first grocery order plus a free gift. So make sure you check out Thrive Market and a big thank you to them for helping this channel out and making this possible. Now let's talk about oxidative stress. So there is something called diabetes induced cerebral oxidative stress. Now, what that is, just like the name implies. Now, this talks about a diabetic person. I'm not suggesting you're diabetic and I'm not a doctor. I'm not qualified to treat that, yada, yada. But it gives some reference points, okay? When someone has chronically high levels of glucose, it affects the neurons and it affects neurons in their brain. If you've ever heard of diabetic neuropathy, that's where you're essentially having damage of the neurons that can create numbness, can create pain. It can be a serious problem. And whether you are classified as diabetic or not, if you are continually having high levels of circulating glucose, there is oxidative damage that goes along with that that could be affecting your nervous system. It could be affecting neurons in your brain, okay? I don't know about you, but that never sounds like a good thing, right? To me, I don't want to affect the neurons in my brain. That seems like it could impair cognitive function. It could cause potential pain down the line. It's just a problem, right? Another thing that we have to almost look at and reverse engineer was there was a study that was published in the journal Diabetologia. And this took a look at using vitamin B1 in a specific benfodiamine form, which isn't really necessarily important right now. But it found that when diabetic subjects took this form of B1, which helps aid in sort of mitigating the potential damages that occur with high hyperglycemia, they found that there was increases in oxygenation, increases in blood perfusion, and ultimately increases in vasodilation. Now, blood perfusion is where you're getting more blood into kind of the nooks and crannies, right? So if you have low blood perfusion, low tissue perfusion, that means the blood's not getting into these nooks and crannies, which is not a very good thing, okay? And if you have high levels of circulating glucose, then yeah, we're probably finding that less, it sort of works in kind of a use it or lose it fashion, right? If you are a normally healthy individual that glucose metabolism is working just fine on, there's no insulin resistance, your body is delivering nutrients to where it needs to go, delivering glucose to where it needs to go. But as you start to have that diminish because of insulin resistance or anything like that, then the glucose doesn't have a need to go into those tissues anymore because it's not getting used anyway. So the body preferentially will just say, well, just go to the core areas, it's all good. We don't need to go into those nooks and crannies because barely getting used anyway. Let's be efficient and let's go to the parts that are important. So ultimately you can end up with less oxygenation, less overall uh, tissue repair and things like that. That's why you see those issues in people that are dealing with high levels of circulating glucose. So it's definitely a problem to pay attention to. And if you're not diabetic, I think it's one of the most important things to monitor. Okay? When it comes down to different risk factors for different things, including obesity, glucose is one of the most important things you can track. I talk about it to the nth degree in multiple videos that if there is one metric I want you to track, it would be your glucose. And that's probably just because that's the camp that I sit in and I read a lot of the literature there. 
but it will tell you a lot about your body. So let me give you a few little tips and things that I have been learning recently that might help you out here. I'm gonna give you five really quick tips. Okay, number one, after you consume carbohydrates, do a little bit of exercise or go for a 10 minute walk, plain and simple, or even just flex your muscles, it sounds cheesy. Okay, number two, swap out high carb snacks for higher protein snacks. That alone is going to make a tremendous difference in what is circulating your HbA1c over the long haul, okay? Number three, take in some chromium or take in even benfodiamine, a form of vitamin B1. Okay, that can help with carbohydrate utilization and the benfodiamine might help with the circulating glucose and the potential damage that occurs as a result of it. Number four, like I kind of talked about before, have space between meals. Give your body a chance to use that glucose, even if it's not using it well, give it a chance to use it before you pile the food on again. Have these strategic periods of time in between and it will help that level mellow out and eventually maybe it will help the cells become a little more sensitive to glucose. The next one might come as a random surprise, but if you have access to a sauna, and if you don't have access to a sauna, take a hot bath, this can, believe it or not, help this hyperglycemia a little bit. And the reason behind it is quite simple. When you are in a sauna, you have an increase in your heart rate and probably an increase in your blood glucose. But what ends up happening is after you get out of the sauna, a lot of times you'll find your baseline heart rate or your heart rate after you get out of the sauna is lower than your baseline before you got in the sauna. That contrast indicates that there is a huge activation of the parasympathetic nervous system, which puts you into a more sort of relaxed state. That relaxed state is going to trigger less release of glucose because stress is going to keep glucose higher. And it's a lot more difficult to just, you know, own, get a control on our stress, right? It's a lot more difficult to do that than it is to maybe get in a sauna and have something that steps in as like an intervention to help bring those glucose levels down a little bit. So again, understanding the risk factors of having high levels of circulating glucose, even if you're not diabetic, is important. And knowing what you can do to sort of jump in and intervene is even more important. I'll see you tomorrow.